Greetings, and welcome to the Black Tavern on Dudley Hill in Dudley, Massachusetts. I would like to begin our video tour of the tavern today with a brief history of the founding of the town of Dudley and the formation of the area we now know today as Dudley Hill. The town of Dudley was petitioned off from the town of Oxford in 1732, when inhabitants of this area petitioned the legislature to form a new community because they felt that they were too far removed from the meeting house or their place of worship. At that time, there was no separation of church and state as we know it today. And one of the requirements to form a new town was to have a meeting house and a preacher. So an agreement was reached with the local Nipmuc Indians and four acres of land was deeded by them on Dudley Hill for the purpose of building a meeting house. As part of this exchange, the Nipmucks were promised a prominent seating location in the meeting house. As we move forward through the years, the area around Dudley Hill continued to grow when in 1797, a young man named Hezekiah Healy married Becca Corbin. Hezekiah was a skilled cabinet maker and spent the first six years of married life making and selling spinning wheels, chests, and four posters until he had saved enough money to build a house big enough for an inn at the intersection of the only two roads in the area near a halfway point on a stagecoach road from Boston to Hartford. He started construction in 1803 and completed it in 1804. This building was the genesis of the Black Tavern and would also function as the family home. Hezekiah came to be a man of considerable importance in his hometown. He was a captain of the militia, a skilled cabinet maker, innkeeper, and inventor. He invented one of the first power looms used in his country. He traveled to Washington to get it patented, but due to lack of funds, he never succeeded. In the early days of the tavern, it was known as Healy's Inn, but as the story is told, the Black Tavern got its name because Hezekiah, in splitting up an old sign, found that the wood painted black was much better preserved than where it was painted in the other color. Like the prudent Yankee that he was, he reasoned that if black paint was good for a sign wood, it would be equally good for his inn. So he painted the entire building black with white trim around the windows. Needless to say, the tavern did not remain black but the name Black Tavern has endured. In the early days of the tavern, Dudley Hill was a thriving place. The Boston Hartford stage came regularly, and then another hotel was built. The area around the hill included a tannery, Nichols Academy, three churches, stagecoach day trips, two stores, two blacksmith shops, a shoe shop, a harness shop, a furniture factory, a shingle mill, a hat factory, woolen mill, and a lawyer's office. Hezekiah would add an addition to the east side of the building in 1810 to use as his cabinet making workshop, and all was well at the Black Tavern, and until 1817 when Hezekiah died at the age of 51. After his passing, his wife Becca continued to run the tavern, and the records indicate and after a few years, they were better off financially than when Hezekiah died. The Black Tavern remained in the Healy family until it was sold to Nichols College in 1946. Nichols College used the building for over 30 years as a guest house, dormitory, and for other functions until in 1980, the college announced plans to demolish it. Not wanting to see this happen, a group spearheaded by the Williams and Mosley families, local descendants of Hezekiah Healy, began to meet to discuss ways to save it. The group incorporated under the name of Black Tavern Historical Society of Dudley and received the title to the building in April 1984.
they made applications to have the building registered on the State and National Historic Register. And this was finalized in May of the following year. Work on restoring the building began at once with volunteer labor and donated materials. Various fundraisers along with memorial gifts and financial donations from members and friends supported the effort. After seven years of incredible effort on the part of many volunteers, the restoration was completed and the building was officially open to the public with a celebration on May 6, 1991. During the time that Nichols College had owned the property, they had converted the original barn and the adjacent structure, we call the annex, into housing for students and the building continued in this capacity until about 2000. By the winter of 2001, it became apparent that the college intended to remove the building for expansion. At that point, the college approached the Black Tavern Society and offered to sell the property to the society. After negotiations, the barn and the land surrounding it were purchased from Nichols College for $17,000 on May 10th of 2002. In 2003, the society began the restoration process in phases over the next nine years as funding became available. In 2011, the barn and annex were placed on the National Register of Historic Places and our first function, a town-wide celebration, was held in the completed barn. Finally, in the spring of 2012, the restoration of the barn and annex was completed with the reconstruction of the east and south walls of the annex. The first room of an inn that any traveler would want to enter would be the bar room. This was the place where refreshments were served, news was shared, and entertainment might be available. The room was obvious to any traveler because of the bars that protected the alcoholic spirits, which were dispensed by the bartender or barkeep. This person was the central source of not only refreshments, but also the gossip and news of the day that other travelers had shared. Usually a man, because it was felt a woman would not be able to control any roughhousing that might occur. This was also often the owner of the inn a person of rather high status in the town. Because of his knowledge of all town and regional news, the innkeeper might also be the leader of the local militia company. His opinion might be sought by fellow townsfolk as well as travelers. The tap room was primarily a man's domain. Card playing, gambling, smoking were prominent in this room. A clay pipe could be used for a fee to smoke tobacco. Dogs might be in here with their masters. A spittoon was prominent for those men chewing tobacco. It was then a dirty, noisy, smelly retreat for men and often the site of music if travelers carried any instruments such as harmonicas, fiddles, or fifes. The furniture was the least serviceable in the entire building. Men were too rough to be allowed anything but basic chairs and benches and well-constructed tavern tables. In this bar room, unexpectedly, we find a grandfather clock, well made by Hezekiah Healy and still in working order after 200 years. This was the hub of activity for the inn and the source of important income derived from the sale of spirits. The parlor of the tavern was the place for the ladies to retire after a long journey on the stagecoach. Upon arrival, the ladies would frequently inquire for the location of the hollyhock, a delicate way of asking for the outdoor privy. Others, such as the parson of the church, were also entertained here. In the parlor, the woman of the house displayed items that were a gesture of culture and civilization for guests and visitors alike. 
It is here in the parlor where Becca Healy would have displayed her best furnishings, curtains, and other items of value to the household. You can just imagine what conversations might have taken place over local and national news. Guests were expected to be on their best behavior for fear of insulting the owner. Here hangs a replica of morning silhouette depicting Becca Healy grieving over the untimely deaths of both her husband and son. Their passing meant that she would take over running the tavern. The present day museum room was added to the tavern in 1830. During the 19th century, it served as a post office, general store, and harness workshop. Today we use this room to display original artifacts from the Black Tavern in Dudley Hill. The secretary desk in this room contains several books authored by Dr. Charles Goodell, the grandson of tavern builder Hezekiah Healy, the last member of the family who lived here at the tavern. Dr. Goodell was a nationally known Methodist radio evangelist during the 1920s and the 1930s and wrote at least 17 books with religious themes. In addition to these books, he wrote two books relating to life on Dudley Hill and the Black Tavern. One, The Old Don Man, was a New England tale of an old eccentric who traveled the loop from farm to farm, the area relying on others and small jobs to get by. The other, The Black Tavern Tales, include stories about living on Dudley Hill and in the Black Tavern. During the restoration of the Black Tavern, many silkworm cocoons were found in various areas of the building, raising questions about their origin. It seems that during the 1830s and 1840s, raising silkworms was a cottage industry in the area for the production of silk. Dr. Charles Goodell notes that in 1842, our family lived in the middle tenement. Aunt Becca lived in the L, raised silkworms, picked mulberry leaves, spread about the house, laid on cloth, worms inside the cocoon. Cocoon put in hot water, killing the worm, then the silk wound off. So the mystery of why silkworm cocoons were so prominent throughout the building during its restoration was solved. One of our most cherished possessions found here at the tavern is that of Becca Healy's teapot, which brings us to the story of the wandering teapot. Becca already had some fine china that she had bought in Boston, as well as some that had come down from her family. But she wanted something special, and a set was ordered from London. Evidently, it caused quite a stir in town when it was learned that Becca Healy was too good to buy crockery from the local store or even from Boston, but had sent her order to London. A special order it was too. There were to be two teapots. On one side of the teapot, to be printed in letters large enough to be read, easily, the name of Becca Healy. On the other side was to be a map of the United States. At that time, it extended only to the Louisiana Purchase. On one side of the map, a likeness of George Washington. On the other side of the map, a likeness of Benjamin Franklin. And hovering over it all, what looks like an angel. In due time, the order was filled and shipped in an English boat. But by that time, the War of 1812 had broken out. As the boat neared New England coast, the English ship with the tea set on it was taken over by Yankee privateers and taken into Boston Harbor as a prize. There, all the ship's goods, including Becca's crockery, were sold to the highest bidder. The tea set happened to be bought by a Worcester merchant. When he discovered two teapots with the name on them, he thought no one would buy them, so he stored them away on a top shelf. By some chance, and some time later, Becca Healy's brother was in the store and spotted the teapots. Seeing the familiar name, he realized at once what had happened. He bought the teapots and presented them to his sister in the dining room of the tavern, where they remained proudly displayed as long as she lived. 
Eventually, Becca gave one of the teapots to each of her daughters. The one given to daughter Becca was passed down and is now in Colorado. The teapot given to daughter Clorinda stayed in the tavern through 1946. And when the tavern was sold to Nichols College, all track of it was lost. Fortunately, during the period of that time, the tavern was being restored. It was found again in possession of one of Clorinda's descendants, who wished that it be returned back to its originally intended home. So the teapot has wandered back to the Black Tavern once again. This room continues to serve as a living museum where cherished artifacts of local history continue to be donated, preserved, and displayed for all to enjoy. The hearth room was the heart of the home, for it is here where folks gathered for warmth, conversation, meals, entertainment, and prayer. As the excerpt from John Greenleaf Whittier's poem, Snowbound Above the Hearth captures so eloquently, sit with me by the homestead hearth and stretch the hands of memory forth to warm them by the wood fire's glow. Memories are what make this building so special to many people. The Reverend Dr. Goodell expressed it very well in his book, The Black Tavern Tales. In it, he records much of the life beat of the tavern as no one else could. He grew up here and loved it as a home and wrote, in the early 1840s, there was a bed in the kitchen. Father worked on the shoe bench in one corner. Mother worked at a spinning wheel on the other side of the room. It was a case of roast one side and freeze the other. Warming pans were used to warm the beds. Anson and Edwin, two small children, slept in what had been the china closet in tavern days. In later years, we boys usually paired apples or popped corn in the fireplace. As we enter the hearth room, we see Becca Healy beginning her day before dawn coming in from the outhouse and stoking the coals from last night's fire. The hearth had to be kept going day and night, not only as the only source of heat, but as the only source for cooking and baking. With a good supply of wood, she was constantly feeding the fire. Meal preparation began early in the day as she filled the heavy cast iron cauldron with root vegetables, bits of lard, deer or chicken meat, herbs and broth. And then placing it on the crane to let it simmer slowly all day for the evening meal. She then prepared the beehive oven for the baking of her breads, pies, muffins for the week. With no thermometer, she became adept at detecting when the temperature was just right for baking with the test of her arm. To prevent burning herself, she used a wooden peel to move baked goods in and out of the beehive oven. During the cold winter nights, she would warm the upstairs beds with a bed warmer, cautiously placing coals in the pan to carry them upstairs to heat the icy cold bed sheets. Adults and little ones often slept downstairs close to the warmth of the hearth. All women's work was done in long dresses, and they had to have an acute awareness of the danger of fire catching their clothing as they worked long hours by the hearth. At day's end, she was finally able to set a while and gaze into the glow of embers and listen to the men talk of their day's happenings. The second floor of the tavern provided a number of important functions. Most importantly was the provision of sleeping accommodations. 
Travelers in the 19th century were accustomed to having to share sleeping spaces with strangers. Although men and women were separated, beds were shared by two or more people, depending on the number of travelers that showed up. For this tavern, the second floor ballroom had partitions that could be raised during the day for large group meetings like militia gatherings or a social event, such as a dance, and lowered at night to form two large bedroom spaces. The hardware for the partitions remains in place along the center beam. When the tavern was turned into a family home, this space was available for important domestic duties, such as weaving that required a large loom. This small room on the second floor is devoted to displaying furniture and clothing that was appropriate for small children. The most interesting items are rope beds, where rope was strung between the rails of the bed to form webbing that would hold the mattress. These ropes would naturally expand and lose the tautness needed to keep the bed from sagging, so a dowel was used to tighten the ropes. The old saying, sleep tight, came from this need to adjust the ropes. Clothing for children did not indicate girl or boy usage. Both wore similar outfits for the first few years as a matter of economy and thrift. Long shirts functioned as both daytime and nighttime wear. Toys were usually handmade affairs, although dolls with china heads eventually became popular. Basic wooden and cloth creations sufficed for most children especially since there were few stores available for frivolous diversions, and children were needed to help out as soon as they were old enough to handle chores. The present day civil law room was a bedroom during the 1800s, and is now used to house artifacts that tell the stories of the four civil law soldiers. Hanson and Edwin Goodell, and their cousins, Abile and George Williams, who were all born and lived here at the Black Tavern. All were grandchildren of tavern builder Hezekiah Healy. The tavern is fortunate to have 50 original letters written by Civil War soldier and ancestor Hanson P. Goodell of the 25th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment between 1861 and 1877 donated by the family of Harold and Claudine Goodell of Murrieta, California in 2004. Shortly thereafter, Marion Mosley, granddaughter of Abiah Williams, donated copies of his letters to add to this collection. Anson and his brothers, Edwin, along with his cousins Abiah and his brother, George, were but a few of the Dudley boys who went off to fight in the Civil War. Edwin would lose his leg at Cold Harbor, and George would make the supreme sacrifice when he was killed at Petersburg. But thankfully today in their letters, we are still able to share their thoughts, hopes, dreams, and beliefs. We are fortunate to have these letters today because Anson Goodell, when he was about to embark on a ship at Annapolis, Maryland, that was to take him to the seat of war in North Carolina in January of 1862, wrote in one of his letters. We expressed a cigar box full of letters. To you, mine will please preserve by putting in my letter box till return, or if I forget to return, give them to Ellen. And since many letters would describe battles he took part in and detail the life of a soldier, but in several, he also wrote of his longing for life back home at the tavern, as shown in a letter written while in his tent shortly before Thanksgiving in 1863, when he wrote, It is Saturday evening. The rain comes pattering against the tent, making the long eve rather lonesome and turning one's thoughts homeward. I love to think of home to wander in imagination over the promises to step into the back kitchen and stand by the table where I have whiled away many a pleasant hour in social chat, 
while mother was making the bread for our next morning repast. It is good to look through the rooms upstairs, the parlor, and examine the books and take a seat in the big easy chair, hence to my little studio where reminiscences are very dear as the place where many a difficult problem in arithmetic, algebra, or geometry has cost hours of painful toil. The letters also allow us to see the sorrow that visited families back home with the news of the death of loved ones. This is shown in a letter written by Avile's younger brother, John, telling him of his brother George's death at Petersburg, Virginia. Dudley, July 4th, 1864. Dear brother, I wrote you but a day or two ago, but Hezekiah wishes me to write to you a few lines today, the 4th of July, that our brother George is gone. He was wounded on the 16th and died the 21st. Oh, how real the war seems when it comes to our own door. God grant that your precious life may be spared and you be permitted to come home and be a comfort to mother and to us all. I cannot realize his death yet, but the reality will come. Excuse me from writing more at present. As ever your affection, Brother John. P.S. Edwin Goodell is not quite as well. They are nearly discouraged about his recovery. Finally, the letters show us the incredible grief as families tried to have the remains of their loved ones return home with this letter written in reply to Albigent Williams' request about getting his son George Champion's body returned home after his death at Petersburg, Virginia. Washington, D.C., October 15th, 1864. W. Williams, Dudley, Mass. Dear Sir, in reply to yours of the 11th of this month, I have to say that upon application of the War Department yesterday, I was informed that by the order of Lieutenant General Grant, no bodies at City Point would be disinterred until after a heavy frost. There are reliable undertakers here who could obtain and forward the body if you desire to save the trouble and expense of a journey here. The expense would be about $100, which would include going to City Point, securing and putting in an airtight coffin, and expressing to Massachusetts. In the following passage, Dr. Goodell expresses his feelings about the company they had and the times which they spent around the fireplace. Quote, there is a larger debt I can never pay to that company who used to sit with me around the fireplace in the Black Tavern in my childhood and youth. All these our hearts remember well. My father and mother, my brothers and cousins, and that cyclopedia of history, tradition, and folklore, Aunt Becca. I wave the wand of memory, and we are all around the fireplace once more. The aroma of popcorn is in the air. There are pies and donuts from the pantry, and on the cellar stairs are the feet of those who bring us nuts and apples and cider from barrel and cask. The hickory and white birch are aflame in the great fireplace. We make a large circle, and the wise blind man and the patient darn man take their places with us around the hearth. There is fun and frolic by young and old, and wise saws, and Yankee repartee, and ancient oracle. And when grandfather's clock in the corner strikes nine, my father says that an evening so full of fun and frolic might well be closed. Such are the memories which cluster around the fireplace in the old black tavern. May coming generations throughout New England, and all over our broad land, preserve and perpetuate such traditions of home and pass them on to generations yet unborn." End quote. Today, the Black Tavern Historical Society strives to preserve and perpetuate the story of the tavern on Dudley Hill by keeping its memories alive with educational programs of local history and tours open to all. Little did Hezekiah Healy know that the tavern he built in 1804 would not only need to be rescued from demolition 176 years later, 
but that it would be the families of his great-great-grandchildren who spearheaded this rescue and restoration of it. And what's more, that his great-great-great-grandson and his son continue to be part of this keeping of this historical treasure alive for all to embrace. <laughs>